When I was younger, I used to believe that if I wanted God to bless me, then I have to be a blessing. If I, it, here's an example. If I wanted, well, here, I have to give the church a dollar in order for God to bless me two dollars later. <coughs> it was really interesting. I don't know why. I, I don't know where I picked that up at. But I just often kept thinking that if I wanted God to bless me, then I had to make sure to do my blessing so God would double it at least. <coughs> well, here's the thing, though. Now I, I look back and I'm like, do I not realize that God's already blessed me? What about you? Here's the thing. Do you realize that God has already blessed you? That's if you start to think about some of the ways that God has blessed you, which leads to that question, how do you think God has blessed you? And I, I want to hear some actual, just off the cuff answers. Just start naming them off, listing them off. How do you think God has blessed you? Kids. Kids. With the youth. With the youth. Health. Health. Friends, relatives, relatives, preachers, preachers, <laughs> church family, church family, the church family has really come through for us today. Yes, grace, grace, creation, creation. Let's keep going. Healing, 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 recovery, friendship, friendship. Is what you said? Okay. Uh -huh. Then Alan, what you say? Salvation. Salvation. Fellowship. Fellowship. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Physical strength. Physical strength. I mean. The word. Cookies. The word. Cookies. Let's keep going. I, seriously. Isn't this amazing though? But, but I also know that sometimes the blessing may not always look the way that we would expect it to look. Right? I mean, if we go looking at history, but let's look at what Jesus was bringing in, okay? So, we're talking about this a little bit later, so I'm not trying to get ahead of myself too much. But there is a perspective that people had that if you were poor, clearly you must have done something wrong. If you're in the predicament that you're in, there's probably something going on there, okay? That's all I'm going to say for now. But there was, a, there was this aspect that people looked down upon you due to the situation you may be in. And Jesus comes along and he's <laughs> different in Matthew 5. He began to teach them and he said, here's where the blessing comes in. Okay, ready? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn while we're grieving. There's blessing here? Huh. For they will be comforted. What a blessing. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Do I dare say, blessed are they before they even did a thing. Like when God blessed his creation to bless man before man did a thing. Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want you to be a part of my creation. I'm blessing you with this. Here you go. Partner with me. But here is the blessing. God has blessed us with life. Basic number one, one over there. One on one there. I, I don't even know how else to go. We would never experience any of his other blessings without life. And in him is life. Let me ask you something. Does Jesus owe you anything? No. 
Jesus doesn't owe us anything. He, but yet, he's been beyond gracious to come to save us, redeem us, restore us from the grips of Satan, to love us even when we did it or don't love him. One of the points that I had said in the Revealing Light newsletter is we do not do what we do to earn God's love, but we do what we do in response to God's love. Where I'm getting at, even with the blessing, is we don't necessarily bless people to be blessed as though God owes us or as if we made God indebted to us. But we bless because we've already been blessed by God. And yet, did He stop at just the blessing? No, He still blessed you today. He's still going to bless you. When Christ returns, we'll get there. God is still blessing even more than he already has. So look at what he's doing in your life, in your community, in the faith community, in the world. Look at what he did even at that cross. The cross is pivotal, and yet God didn't say it. That was the last blessing you guys have ever received. In the end, God's gracious gift, in God's gracious gift, He will crown us in His glory, 1 Peter 5, 4. This blows my mind. Okay, it says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So, just try to fathom this with me. Okay, this does not make sense. God restores us when we earned it, no. When we make God indebted to us? No. No. God restores us. He adopts us. He calls us his children. And then graciously crowns us in his glory because of what he did through Jesus and his spirit. Look at the prodigal son. Coming back, return after everything had happened. And then the father comes back and says, Bring him, bring him the clothes, bring him the bath and cap. Here's my ring. Bring him some shoes. Bring him. I am going to clothe him with my glory. Does that make sense? God has blessed us. He already has. He will bless us. It's just, it's, it's unfathomable. So that we didn't earn that? God doesn't owe us that? And it's almost baffling to sit here and say, God, you know, you should have seen what I've done for you. Like, I think you owe me something. He gave us life in Jesus Christ, new life in His Spirit. We could have had eternal damnation. Some of you guys love the hellfire and brimstone. Okay, here it is. Like, we could have had eternal separation from God. But what did He do? When we didn't even love him. He loved us graciously. And blessed us and still is blessing us. You have life today? One on one already there? And yet, even that, we're getting there. I, 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 I'm excited. But I, <laughs> we have been separated from God and then he steps in. Out of his love. When our sin and disobedience separated us from God, He stepped in. Does God still owe us? I don't think so. We bless because God has blessed us. Not to receive His blessing as if God is indebted to us, but we were indebted to Him. He's forgiven us. We think back to the king who had his servant, and the servant had a thousand lifetimes of debt. I forgot to look at the number, okay? But the whole point of the parable is that it was too many times. You could relive your life over and over and over again and never repay the debt. That's us with God. And the king comes up and says, I'm forgiving you of that debt. In response, what can we do and should do? Forgive others 
That's not what happened in the parable. No, and so then that's the whole situation. You guys can take your time read it there too. It's Matthew 18. It's another good story. Another one to always be reminded of. What has already been given to us? Then let's share it. We are stewards of what's already been given to us. So I'll say it again. We bless not to receive God's blessing, but we bless because we've already received God's blessing. Now, let me say this in caveat, okay? This is also not to try and repay God either. Because I've been there. I've done that uh, up until, let's see, for sure ninth grade. I was always indebted to God trying to pay Him back. And I can't. I never can repay back what I have done. Otherwise, I would have earned my own salvation, right? Okay. But we respond to God's blessing not out of guilt. But from God's gracious gift. Not out of obligation, but celebration. Not indebtedness, but forgiveness. I had a friend who had come to the previous church. He'd been all over the place, New York, and he was in Nebraska for a while, and he'd been overseas for a while, and he had been doing mission works and stuff, and all these things. And he said this line to me one time, and I resonated with him because I've been there. He said, I don't understand why God keeps blessing me. Every time he blesses me, I hear him saying, now that's going to cost you. He never felt like he could keep up. Every time God blessed him, he's like, why do you keep blessing me? I can't pay you back, God. You're right. That's his grace. Sorry, I got too excited. I had a quick little motion pass there. You're not I know. It's in my bones, okay? I just... But I've been there. Every time I've seen God's blessing, I felt like, God, what did I do to earn this? You did it. This is my grace, mercy, and love. I didn't earn that. But he still offers it and says receive it. Now live in it. Share it. Because it's not just for you. It's for the world. He loves the world. Otherwise, if it was just the now I owe God, now I owe God, now I owe God. God owes me now because I've done all these good things. And there's a thing called a retribution principle. In the Old Testament, this was a very... It became like dogma. It was supposed to be a general truth, a general statement that people followed. That said, generally, this is true. But at times, it became the dogma. What is the retribution principle? The righteous prosper and the wicked, the wicked suffer. Especially when you look at Proverbs. You will easily see this principle throughout, as a general, throughout, throughout your life, generally, when you do good things, good things tend to maybe happen to you. And if you do a lot of bad things, well, it tends to find yourself in bad situations. Generally. But is that always the case? No. No, it's not. So, oftentimes, we, there's a thing about, generally this may be the case, but even with Proverbs, there are a lot of things in here that we take Proverbs as wisdom for our life, as general, good, truth. <laughs> but they are not promises. Because they do contradict right between each other here. Proverbs 24. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that leaves us sometimes in, in confusion. It talks about, look, there's a time where you shouldn't answer a fool. Right? There's a time when you should not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Sorry, it's Proverbs 26, 4. I knew that 4 was there. Proverbs 26, 4. It says, Do not enter a fool according to his foolishness, or you'll be like it yourself. Next verse. Answer a fool. What? Don't answer a fool. Answer a fool. According to his followingness, or he'll become wise in his own lives. 
He sometimes needs to be challenged too. What do we do with that? Don't enter a pool. Enter a pool. Don't enter. What? Depends on the situation. If this is something that, okay, dude, if it's not going to do much harm if you believe that. Just go for it. I, there's no point arguing with you. If this is something that's detrimental that he needs to be challenged on, let's take the time to do that. Okay. That, uh, sorry, that was, a, that was a rabbit trail right there. But what I'm saying is Proverbs are not, and you go through and see, Proverbs are not promises. But Proverbs are a guide for our life that we can glean from. That's why they're so simple to remember and say, oh yes, I remember that proverb. May this guide me now. But the issue here is that people began to believe that this retribution principle became law, became dogma as absolute truth. Seeing the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. Can we just say, what happens at the school shooting? I guess all those kids were just so sinful and they just had it for them. Or, you know, that's why it drives us crazy when we say, why do bad things happen to good people? Because that didn't, the retribution principle, it, we thought this was true always, and it wasn't. Or when we're baffled, when that great family just can't catch a break, why do they keep getting all these things happening to them? Why? We have this confusion, these questions, because life just didn't hold up to that retribution principle. Example. The disciples came up to Jesus and there was this man that was blind there. Following the retribution principle, they said, Jesus, please tell us, this man was born blind. Was it him who sinned or was it his parents who sinned? Who sinned? Because clearly something is wrong here. He wouldn't be in this predicament if there wasn't any sin. You're right. We've all sinned. So what happened here? <coughs> They were living under this dogma and understanding that clearly this family did something wrong. People during that time typically had that mentality for people who were poor too. They're poor because they did something wrong. Because the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned, that his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Watch what happens next. He's healed. Jesus comes in and says, this is forgiveness. This is God's glory being revealed. Okay? Uh, like the application commentary, I said, Jesus shifted their attention away from the cause to the purpose. Jesus demonstrated the power of God by healing the man. Instead of worrying about the cause of our problems, we could instead find out how God could use our problems to demonstrate his power. Look at what he's doing. Even in our lives. Jesus explained that this man's blindness had nothing to do with his sin or his parents' sin. God allowed nature to run its course so that the victim would ultimately bring glory to God through the reception of both physical and spiritual sight. Did we earn everything that we have received that God has blessed us with? No. I'm baffled at the ways that God has blessed me. I'm, I'm sure you're baffled at the ways God has blessed you. But even in this story, they were about to witness the power, glory, and mercy of God through healing this man. Let's look at Job's friends. You guys have probably heard this story. Job, in the first verse, Job 1.1, 1, 1, there was a man in the land of Uz. I just like saying that. That's fun. Whose name was Job? And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Some of you guys are familiar with the story of Job. What happens next? He loses everything. 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 And that's how it opens up. Does this perhaps challenge, hopefully, maybe their understanding of retribution principles? I, that, you know, the bad guy get bad stuff, good guy get good stuff. And yet, when we look at Job, it's not so black and white. Sometimes the righteous suffer. Right? And the wicked prosper. Does the retribution principle always hold firm? No. Simply put, 
uh, again, the Proverbs are wise words for us to follow in our life, to be guides in our life. And the retribution principle offers no guarantees. Kind of like the golden rule. I'll let you guys say it. The golden rule. Is it always fulfilled? No. Sure, exactly. But going back to the retribution principle, but I can do it for all these people. I should receive goodness back. Or treat the others the way you want to be treated. Now, there was also this understanding of an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? What did that look like, the retribution principle? <laughs> the good thing Deuteronomy does kind of look, point at that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture to fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Okay. But then Jesus comes along and challenges the kind of thinking that it had become. Maybe the, those things that the, the people had taken it too far. To say that this is an ultimate truth that always is fulfilled. And Jesus is like, clearly it's not. Because this is about to happen to him. And that definitely defies the retribution principle. Jesus challenges this kind of thinking by showing us God's own heart. You guys have heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, bless your enemies. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, that's easy. But I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5, 46 to 48. For if you love those who love you, I mean, what reward do you have? That's easy. Even tax collectors do the same. But if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? No. Do not even the Gentiles do the same. No, you therefore must be perfect, whole, complete, as your Heavenly Father is perfect, whole, and complete. There's this completeness in being able to see how God has continued to bless. Well, look at this. Who has God blessed? Everyone. God has blessed His enemies. Well, the people who became His enemies. Me. James 4, 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Yet God blessed and blesses us even while we were his enemies. Even Christ died for the godly. Yes, Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us and that while we were so sinners, Christ died for us. Guess who started this? God did God started the blessing. God blesses us with mercy and grace, so do this with others. God blesses us with his love, so love others. 1 John 4, 11, beloved, beloved, us, loved, right there. If God so loves, uh, loved us, we also ought to love one another. Matthew 5, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He doesn't say, well, only you righteous people get the sun today. The sun comes on everybody. Rain comes on everybody, the just and the unjust. Otherwise, we might get in the mentality, God, I've done all of these things for you. Why am I in the predicament I'm in now? Why are all these things happening to <laughs> you? Do you not realize all the things I've done for you, God? Mm. Job loved the Lord, even in the circumstances. James. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Look at our Savior as our example. Peter, in this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Why does he say you can still rejoice? Yes, even while we face many trials, and even while we look at Jesus and at that cross, Jesus didn't deserve that death. We did, but he substituted himself in our place. We see that, yes, the righteous, the righteous, they suffer. The wicked, they prosper. So the opposite of the retribution principle. But, there's a point in this. We're getting into the last part. Stay with me. It may not look like a very blessed life sometimes. 
Yet we're the righteous, those found in Christ, because Christ made us righteous by him alone. Where the righteous are prosperous is in having Christ now and in eternity. The righteous prosper by having Christ, not in the way that we may see it or expect or think it to be. With money and all these things. Look, this is why Paul in Galatians says, look, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is where the prosper comes in. Having Christ above all other things. That is already the biggest blessing we could ever receive. To have our, our relationship restored with God again through Christ. <laughs> to have that relationship now and then to eternity. It says, in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. <coughs> this, this, I just love this part, Romans 14, 8. He, he's not sure exactly of what is all to come, but if he lives, we live to the Lord. He lives with Christ, and if we die, we die to the Lord. There's another spot where he says, to live is to live with Christ, and to die is gain. Because it, whether I'm living now, I have Christ. And if I die, then I see him face to face. I, either way, I have Christ. For him, that's prosperous. To have Christ be righteous. Maybe do prosper. Because the prosperous is Christ. Having Christ is the blessing. Having your short relationship with God hit by him is the blessing. And in the end, Maybe the retribution is May be true, it may not be. Honestly, scholars fight back and forth all the time. But maybe look at the end. And it may not be exactly what we would expect it to look like, but 1 Peter 1 says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, they've been dealing with so many persecutions by now, it's not even funny. They are needing a little bit of word of encouragement. He's like, look, you've been going through tested things. But your faith, which is more prosperous than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not... Now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's start to conclude. <coughs> the blessing we have received from God. Salvation. Redemption. New life in Christ. The gift of God's Holy Spirit. How about just today? Breath today. And the blessings we will receive from God, praise, crown of glory, honor, out of his graciousness, he does that? Did we earn it? No. So though that blessing may not be evident to the world, right? It may not be prosperous to have Christ, but when Christ returns and all is revealed, the righteous man in Christ will be prosperous by having God. Sadly, what was the other part of that retribution principle? Wicked something. Without Christ, they are facing the eternal separation that they have decided themselves a long time ago when they dad want, didn't want anything to do with God. They themselves separated themselves from God. Look, this is, this is nuts. This is why Christ, having, getting to have Christ, getting to share Christ, getting to share the blessing that God has blessed us with, not because we earned it, but out of his pure love, grace, and mercy, has given it to you. He's given it to you, 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 you. 
and don't stop there. So, all this to say, we've already been blessed. And God doesn't stop there. He will bless in the end again. He blesses us for today. We bless, I'll say it again, we bless not to be blessed, but blessed because we've already been blessed. We respond to celebration with forgiveness. We share the blessings God has already shared with us now for the world. We are stewards of what God has blessed us with, the gospel for all people. A restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We may face hardship now. Right? Because we see all the time that the righteous in Christ most definitely may suffer. And great people suffer all the time. But when Christ returns, having Christ is prosperous for those who have received Christ's righteousness by faith. So, let's share the blessings God has blessed us with. That is why the title in this last point is Bless <coughs> God's Blessing. The blessings He has already given you. We bless and we share out of celebration, out of forgiveness. Thank you, God. Let's pray. Honestly, God, your word says it all. All I can say is thank you. All we can say is thank you. May we respond by sharing your blessings. Though it may not look like blessings that the world tends to look at, whether it, I don't know, a job title or finances or the things that we have that are kind of decaying in just less than 100 years. I mean, those things are not prosperous. They don't last. But what lasts is the relationship with you. Your love lasts. Your grace lasts. What your son, Jesus Christ, has done lasts. We are prosperous in what Christ has done. May we offer ourselves a living sacrifice at that point. That we may die to ourselves so that Christ may live in us. That we have life in Christ each and every day saying thank you. For what you have done. Because honestly this isn't even my life. It's yours. Everything you've given us. Is yours. So let's share it. Help us share it. However that is. Whether it be a word of encouragement. Whether it be a word of hope. Whether it be a word of love. Whether it be a word of grace. Whether it be a love or word of forgiveness. May we bless others with the blessings you have already blessed us with. And yet, unfathomably, you're going to bless us with your crown of glory through what your son did. Like the prodigal son coming home and the father is sitting there saying, let's clothe him, let's give him these things. And the son's just there saying, what have I done? All I've done is everything against you. And you're like, my love and grace is sufficient. Now receive this and live by it. You are my son. God, may we live by being your children. That you've adopted us. May we invite all people into your adopted family. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. And thank you for your son. Thank you for this family here that gathers together. Thank you for the neighbors that we have, the communities that we have. May we continue to offer the blessings that you have already blessed with us. In your son's name, Jesus Christ.